Asalaamu As Alaikum, hello and welcome to the show. Now, today we discuss something very interesting and that's Makasid. Makasid is an Arabic word for goals or purposes. In an Islamic context, the term can refer to the purposes of Islamic faith, that is zakah, pilgrimage, or the Qur'an's and Sunnah's text. In terms of Sharia, there are five foundational goals. These are the preservation of religion, life, lineage or progeny, intellect, and property. So these noted represents the commonly understood conception of Makasid developed by the 12th century Islamic scholar Al-Ghazali. The most significant development of the Makasid occurred in the 14th century through the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah. Now, essentially Makasid was defined as the attainment of good, wealthy, advantage of benefits, and hoarding off of evil, injury, and loss of creatures. However, it was not until modern times that the Islamic scholars have shown a renewed interest in the Makasid. So that brings us to the aspect of Ibsa in South Africa, now taking these teachings one step forward in this region, which had to Dr. Jasir Auda in his year as an international guest going to spearhead this uh, for Ibsa. And so we find out more about this concept and how he's going to do that. Dr. Jasser, welcome to South Africa and, and back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Now, you're here with a very specific mission, and that's uh, the Makasid and Ipsa. Um, but before we go there, let's uh, talk about yourself for a few moments, uh, just to understand why uh, you've taken on this task. Uh, I've taken on the task of uh, taking Maqasid al-Sharia to the next level. Uh, for the past uh, decade and been involved in similar uh, endeavors for a decade before, we were spreading the knowledge that Islam has objectives, Islam has principles and values and ethics that are at the core of Islam and its practice. Uh, now, this stage, we are trying to see how exactly is Islam an ethical way of life? How are the values activated in the reality of the people? So for a decade and two decades perhaps before, we studied the fuqaha and the usuliyin and the scholars and what they had to say. And uh, I was involved in reading and writing and teaching. But now I think it's time to do research and to answer questions that are of concern to people, Muslims and non-Muslims. How can Islam contribute to today's life? So, so we look at the, um, the, the Sharia as a component, as an integral component of the existence of uh, Muslims um, and then at the same time of people in general. And then we find this concept of Makasid, which is, which is something that perhaps I might have heard of only a couple of days ago, but now I decided to, to delve into that and have a look what that's all about. Um, what is that thing and what do we understand as Makasid? We've done an intro, which was fairly brief, but your understanding of Makasid itself. Uh, in your intro, you mentioned correctly that uh, a number of scholars had developed the maqasid. You mentioned the most popular uh, structure of maqasid, that's the preservation of faith and soul and mind and intellect and property, etc. Uh, but maqasid has a higher level than that, that is very important. Uh, what we call in the Sharia al kulliyat or the universal values. The universal values that the Sharia is here to achieve in people's lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Hadid that he sent messengers and books so that people could establish justice. So justice is even a higher value than the values of the preservation of mind and so on. And when we teach Sharia proper in the usul, in the fundamentals of the Sharia, we teach that Sharia is all about justice. And every opinion that takes Sharia from being about justice to being about injustice is not Sharia even if it is claimed to be so with an interpretation. So the universal values govern the interpretation. The interpretations, uh, which we call fiqh, is not supposed to go against the values of Islam. We cannot have an interpretation that perpetuates injustice or cruelty or uh, non nonsense versus wisdom or um, common mischief versus common good. These are the higher values of Islam. And if we're going to practice Islam in the 21st century in a modern society, we have to be first and foremost about achieving these values on the ground. Uh, when we talk about the economy, when we talk about the environment, we talk about family, we talk about media, 
these values are at the core of the ethics of dealing with all of this. So this is what. Do you perhaps feel that um, society at large, and, and perhaps in today's time where we find lots of challenges as a society, as Muslims we see lots of things happening from the West down and, and comments and issues being held all the time. Do you feel that, that there might be a misrepresentation or misunderstanding in terms of the Sharia itself? And this aspect of Muslim might be slightly absent uh, or might have been absent for a while. Absolutely. And this is very unfortunate that uh, in the lives of people at large, um, we discuss how to pray and how to do zakan, how to do hajj. And when it's Ramadan, we have all of these small questions about uh, the moon and what uh, you know breaks your fast, the, the very small issues. And when you go to hajj, we are only concerned about the movements and the rituals, but we don't ask why. We don't look behind the ritual into the why of the ritual, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to fast. Why is he asking us to pray? That's why the Prophet sallam said, if you pray and you're not a better person, then you don't, you don't, your prayers are, are, are not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. And if you fast and you continue to lie, he said, then your fasting is void. And if you do pilgrimage and then you go back to do the same sin, then you don't need your pilgrimage. Because it's had no effect on you. Exactly, because the why is to be a better person with Allah first and to be a better person with people. On the other hand, Islamic education does not focus much on the objectives and the morals and the principles. To be honest, I have students coming from major Islamic universities after five or seven years of studying Islam and they have never heard about Maqasid al-Sharia. And they come to do a PhD on Sharia and never heard about the objectives of the Sharia, which is the bigger picture. Sharia is about the common good and the mercy and, the, and people's uh, welfare in this life. Uh, it's not only about the rules and, and the do's and the don'ts. In fact, the do's and the don'ts are part of a bigger picture. Can I narrow this down to a more pragmatic approach and, and to take a matter on the ground, for example, have I got this right if I say that, for example, um, let's look at Saudi Arabia. Somebody steals, for example, and the ruling is that the air needs to be cut off for that. Um, how does Makassid come into that? And I know that there might be different um, uh, rulings for, for example, if there's poverty and that kind of thing, certain things apply and certain things don't. I understand all of that. But do you think that uh, that with the West sees as barbaric and um, I would say that, that those are seen as actions that are, are sort of not acceptable, for example. Do you think that when we look at Makassid and, and the relation between why that ruling is there and the purpose of that ruling, uh, that we'd have a better understanding then? I mean, let's use that as an example. Well, I, I believe in a degree of relativity in terms of deciding about criminal punishments in societies. Uh, some societies believe that a capital punishment is uh, cruel and, and something that goes against human rights and basic right of life. And some other societies agree and have a consensus that a capital punishment for a murderer, for example, is something that is justified and, and so forth. Um, but what is unfair and what is cruel is for these punishments to apply to people and not other people. Uh, that is the problem. It's not about the punishment itself. I could argue with you or I could, I could tell you that my view that these punishments are means to an end rather than ends in their own rights. And therefore, uh, we could have different types of punishments, especially in a multi-faith society and a multicultural society where Muslims are not the only people who decide about criminal punishments, even if they believe something to be an end in its own right. But I am totally against uh, applying uh, this punishment, which is harsh by any standard, to a driver who steals a wallet and not to a prince who steals $2 billion or to a poor maid who, who steals to feed her children, uh, I mean a house, uh, house cleaner or uh, what they call maids in that part of the world, versus a, you know, some princess who uh, proves to steal from the public money uh, and so forth. And that, that is when it becomes problematic. 
and that is when you smell the, uh, the, the scent of using religion for political purposes. That is a problem. So it is barbaric in the sense of not being applied on all people. Uh, but if it applies to the rich and the poor, the powerful and the less powerful, then every society decides what their criminal punishment should be. So effectively, if, you, if you're applying the aspect of Mokasset uh, around all of this, um, you effectively then do, do believe that the world would have a better understanding of why the Sharia says certain things. Yeah, of course. The why is very important because the why governs the application. Like, w why is there a punishment? Uh, one uh, wisdom is for the punishment to be a deterrent. If the punishment is not a deterrent, then it's not a proper punishment. Uh, and that's the punitive aspect, um, the deterrence of all of that. Exactly. But then, if the punishment is, go is going to go beyond being a deterrent to being something that incapacitates a citizen in a modern society, so that the government then will have to take care of that disabled person now, then it goes far beyond being a deterrent to being a problem. Uh, if it is going to be something that applies to some people and not others, like some people in, in Malaysia and had this discussion, I was in Malaysia a couple of months ago, some members of parliament there uh, proposed to apply the hudud or the criminal punishments in Islam on Muslims only and not non-Muslims, for example. And what I mentioned there is that, no, this is, that doesn't, make a state. You cannot be one country and I have a punishment for a crime and my neighbor doesn't have a punishment for the same crime. And that's not fair. And so forth. So the problems are with uh, people when they misunderstand the why, the purpose. Why do we do that? And the why is also a common ground between Muslims and non-Muslims. Muslims don't live alone in any society, whether majority or minority. And the question of why finds a common ground between us and others. And therefore, we can cooperate on uh, matters and issues of justice, issues of people's welfare. Uh, everybody can uh, cooperate on feeding the hungry and uh, you know, giving shelter to the shelterless and so forth. This, these are human. Uh, so that takes Islam, or rather the Islamic agenda, from being only about Muslims to being about humanity, which is the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we rewind the tape a little bit and we find that um, Ghazali and then the 14th century, all of this comes to the fore in some form of writing. And then we say that modern scholars are now picking up again. What happened in between? What happened in between uh, is what we call in uh, the Islamic scholarship, the Dark Ages. You see, the Dark Ages in the European sense were the Golden Ages in Islam, the ages of Baghdad and Andalusia. But then Baghdad and Andalusia went down, and we had a Dark Age of colonization and um, systems that did not care about the citizen uh, for centuries, since systems that exploited people in the especially Muslim majority parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, scholarship also suffered. Scholarship. Uh, over the past uh, three or four centuries before the 20th century was about summarizing the summaries of the summaries of the footnotes and making all of this in nice poetry and memorizing rather than understanding and repeating rather than creating. Uh, 20th century with the age of hopefully emancipation and revolutions and all of that in many parts of the Muslim majority countries people started to think about Islam as a way of life and as a system of governance in some sense and as an economic system and as a family uh, value system and so on. And therefore serious questions started to be answered. Did we answer all the questions? No, I think we, there are so many questions that are still left unanswered. But we started to answer the questions by starting to reinterpret Islam in the modern age. And therefore, you mentioned, for example, the preservation of progeny or offspring. This is something that our fuqaha, the jurists, talked about for long, regarding the children being named after the father and being related to the father, which is an Islamic thing. Now, we are actually talking about the preservation of family rather than the preservation of progeny. And therefore, family as a unit in modern life is something that Islam took care of in many ways. We're starting to discuss that. 
the preservation of wealth from my money being stolen or my money this into more socioeconomic questions and socioeconomic answers that we need to give as Muslims. What we call the Islamic view of economy or the Islamic finance is not just about individual issues and my money and how to be fair when I buy a date fruit or whatever. It's not about that. It is about the society and how to achieve social justice. We haven't answered the question so far in the 20th century until today of how can we achieve social justice from an Islamic perspective. Hence this program that we're working on to answer contemporary questions uh, that are the concerns of the contemporary world. We cannot be still asking the questions of history and answering them from history and living in history. How, how can we do that as Muslims? And then how can we live Islam in contemporary life if we don't answer the contemporary questions? The, the concept of Mukhasida, does it actually uh, make way for some type of evolution, if I can use that term, or change in dimension? So this means as we traverse along the timeline of time and we go and we've come from the last 1400 years and wherever we are going, the dynamics in society changes, the world changes, um, the way things are done changes, the way people commit crimes changes. Um, does it allow for that change? Yes, and actually this is part of the nature of the Sharia, part of the nature of Islam, that it... So it's not set in stone? No, it is not. In fact, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu he said that every hundred years, Allah sends a man or a group of men, a group of people, uh, anyway, men and women, of course, who renew, man yujaddidu laha dinah, who renew Islam for this ummah. The renewal of Islam, the redefinition of things. As you mentioned, crime now is different. We cannot deal with crime in the same way. Uh, rich and poor and their relationship is different. Even if you want to pay zakah, which is ibadah. Now, the thing you own to make you rich so that we consider you rich enough to pay zakah is different. And you pay zakah in a different way. The fuqaha in the past said, you know, you give uh, that amount of barley or raisin or whatever. You can't really today talk about Islam seriously and you want to go and give a poor, a, you know, a pot of raisin or a box of barley. And you couldn't- And no, we lots have seen a box of barley. Yeah, they don't understand. What do they do with this? You want to give the poor a housing to live in uh, with dignity. You want to give- It's contextual within, within the space today. Exactly, you want to give the poor an education. I was giving a lecture yesterday in the uh, waqf uh, event that IPSA had about its own waqf, launching its own waqf. And several brothers were not, um, they did not accept that I said that you can give zakah to that waqf. And they said, no, but the zakah is for the poor. Uh, I said, isn't zakah for the student of knowledge? They said, yeah. I said, well, you are giving the college so it spends on the students of knowledge. Uh, what is the difference? They said, well, but you know, Allah and his messenger did not say give a zakah to a college. Give a zakah. And I mentioned, I said, no, this is just the new way of learning. Be because today, if you look at university fees, they form a substantial amount of fees compared to in the past. Education is very expensive today, and which student or oh, uh, there are a limited amount of students that can afford these things in any case. Well, the Islamic view on that is that education has to be affordable. Uh, education in Islam is a right, uh, and in fact is an obligation. Talab al-Ilmi Farida, Prophet said that seeking knowledge is an obligation. So you cannot morally obligate me to do, that, to do something and then charge me that, uh, an amount that I cannot afford. So if you really go back to the philosophy of Islam in this, uh, the Islamic point of view is totally with people who are asking for the tuition fees to be affordable. Uh, we have a similar problem. I live in Canada now. I lived in the UK before. We have similar problems where students uh, basically took to the streets and said, no, we, we can't have tuition fees that are unaffordable. Uh, and from an Islamic point of view, we supported these students because this is Islamic, to have knowledge affordable. And of course, uh, there is an economic side of, of the argument, of course, that is very important to consider. Uh, but uh, it is very important to make knowledge affordable. Now, we, we understand the concept of Mokhasid and, and we briefly know that this forms an integral part of getting society to where we need to, to be and trying to solve some of those problems that just keep mushrooming around the world as we go along. 
So IPSA decides that uh, they need to go along and get this running in South Africa. How did all of that start? And uh, I know that there's an extensive program we're looking at, uh, I think ending with the masters for now. Uh, and I know Dr. Jasser is going to be sort of spearheading that operation. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, well, uh, we founded a, an institute in London called Maqasid Institute uh, that uh, promotes the education uh, of Islamic thought from a Maqasid perspective. Uh, we thought that we need to found a program uh, that takes Maqasid Sharia to the next level of academia, having a serious academic program. So this is a syllabus itself on, on Maqasid? The whole syllabus, whether we're talking about the environment or societies or health or arts, or fiqh uh, is all about maqasid and how maqasid could be uh, initiated and activated. And then we had a group of uh, professors and researchers and we were discussing where in the world could this happen. And we had a number of candidate places. Uh, I'm very glad that South Africa materialized in that project. And I think that the uh, recent uh, experience with emancipation, with diversity with social justice. We are a society of change. We are a society of change. We are a very diverse society. Uh, I'm amazed by the diversity of races and languages and backgrounds. Uh, you're, a, you're a society of emancipation and freedom, uh, even though I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm aware that there are issues uh, with, with that. But you're a society that's trying to be free. And freedom is the best environment where you can do Islamic thought. Because you do Islamic thought under tyrannies, as we see in some Muslim-majority countries, you don't produce proper Islamic thought. You produce Islamic thought that serves the tyrants, that does not speak uh, you know, truth to power. And you need an Islamic th thought that produces uh, new ideas and new institutions and does advocacy without fear of persecution and without politicization as well. This is a nonpartisan. Uh, non-ideological kind of uh, academic uh, experiment where we are building a master's and then a PhD program, uh, inshallah, with IPSA. We're starting this year with an honors program that completes the three-year bachelor's program that IPSA has. And then starting 2017, inshallah, we will have a master's program. So students that wish to apply now for 2016, for example, and throughout 2016 going up, um, what do they expect to, is it a challenging course, for instance, or are they, um, do they have to have some foundational basis uh, within Islamic studies already to get to that point? If they come from a background that does not have any Islamic studies, uh, we give them what we call a bridging program of a few courses up to a year of qualifying them to get into a master's in Islamic thought, as we uh, called it. If their background is uh, economy, uh, economics, or political science, or public administration, or medical sciences, or engineering. We are bridging between them and studying these very subjects, but from an Islamic perspective. And also, if their background is Islamic studies, they also need a bridge. Uh, they cannot get right into uh, an Islamic economics study without some economics 101, you know. Uh, they cannot uh, start to talk about political issues without getting some, some good sense of politics and what it means, or deal with policy issues without some introduction to policy sciences and what they mean, and so forth. So we're, we are qualifying people with Islamic studies to deal with real life, and people who come from the, li the sciences of the reality to deal with Islam. We're qualifying both students. So um, we have people watching the program now that, uh, and we all do this, we sit by every night wondering how we're going to change the world and all the problems in the world. We understand all of that and we become some level of couch activist because we just, sometimes that's all that we can do. Um, I, I suppose empowering ourselves and reading and getting involved with this kind of thing might add to that philosophical change over time, uh, which we direly need right now as a society. What's your message to prospective students out there watching the program now, why they should be doing this program? Well, to prospective students uh, watching the program, we are looking for the bright minds and the faithful hearts um, from any background. Uh, if you are concerned about Islam and Muslims, or if you are concerned about humanity 
and you are not even a Muslim, but you would like to do an Islamic studies degree, you would like to study uh, Islam and what it can offer the world, then enroll in this program, uh, whether you are young or old, but you have the intellectual uh, capacity to produce ideas. Ideas that are not only philosophy, ideas that translate, inshallah, into advocacy and translate into organizations and initiatives that will change the reality. Uh, we are not going to allow a thesis to be written without a problem identified in the reality and then a solution given to that problem. So, uh, inshallah, we're all partners in this renewal uh, endeavor and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us, inshallah. I suppose it's some level of revival uh, at the same time to, to go back to basics so that we, we were able to deal with issues um, coming up as they do come up uh, right now. Dr. Jasser, uh, there's been some adjustment on your side um, having to come in and out of South Africa quite a few times in 2016. Uh, just on a lighter note, are you looking forward to spearheading this particular project? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, South Africa is a great country. Uh, right now it's freezing in Canada, so it's great to be here. <laughs> but uh, subhanAllah, no, I, uh, I, I love this country. And alhamdulillah, uh, being in different places around the world, um, uh, south or east or west or north, doesn't matter. What matters is the reception of the ideas and the ability to move forward. And I think this is a great place to do that. So, inshallah, you'll see more of me as, uh, as time goes by, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Jassi. Zakallah khair. Dr. Jassi, and uh, he's going to be here with IPSA for, the, for 2016. Uh, taking our students through that Makassid study, something that's really required uh, within the context of South Africa and around the world, uh, please do contact IPSA. The details were running throughout the program. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>